I leaned against the door and exhaled slowly. Relief flooded me as I was finally alone. The voices in my head, the feelings in my chest, just melted away. They weren't really mine and it was nice to be left alone with only my own thoughts. It had been a hectic day at work. Everybody was stressed and I could feel it all. During days like this, I always considered leaving my job for some freelancing so I could be by myself more. But I loved my job and the telepath thing wasn't as hard as it had been as a teenager. So I stayed. I took off my shoes and my socks in the hallway, went barefoot over the hardwood floor. I loved the feeling of my bare feet on the floor, on the carpet, on the grass. I left my bag by my home desk before I continued to the kitchen. Today was Friday and that meant nachos with loads of cheese and guacamole while going through this week's episode of a bunch of different TV shows. I was even making myself a drink. Thinking about the boxes in the hallway, I was getting a new neighbor, hoping the new one would be better than the drummer from before. It came creeping slowly. Like when the sun is setting, but you're not really paying attention until you're sitting in the dark. It began with the shoulders feeling stiff. I didn't think about it. Just let my hands massage it lightly. Then it crept to the back of my skull. I did some stretches to help relieve the pain, but it got stronger and stronger until it felt like I was going to pass out. Someone was in pain. The kind of pain that makes you think about doing stupid stuff. Internal screaming worse than I had ever heard before, competing only with the time I was at the hospital and they brought in a five-year-old girl who had been hit by a car. Her mom didn't know if the girl was going to survive. I had vomited in the bathroom and left. I forced myself out of the couch. It was coming from next door and I was worried that there had been an accident or maybe they needed some kind of help. I didn't even put on shoes before entering the hallway. I wasn't sure I was going to make it back up if I bent down. Slowly, I made my way down the hallway and knocked on the door. Waited a few seconds. The door opened and everything went black. It felt like someone was trying to slice my head open. I focused on my feet. I could still feel them and I was still standing up. A single droplet of sweat was making its way slowly down my back. Are you okay? A voice asked. His face was changing from really annoyed to sort of concerned. Yeah, I said, trying to focus on the black of a tattoo that was sticking out from under his t-shirt. The almost white hair was hurting my eyes, especially considering the light from behind making it glow like a halo. His t-shirt was also white, everything to make me feel as horrible as possible. I was weighing the option of throwing up on his shoes as revenge but decided against it. Are you okay? I asked. Except from the stranger looking like she's going to die on my doorstep? Yes. What do you want? To see if you're okay. Why? He asked, and I heard the skepticism in his voice. The black on the tattoo was a little curved, or my vision was going haywire. I thought I heard a scream. I got worried. I tried to smile at him, but I was pretty sure I just made a face at him. Do you have a problem with tattoos? No, I said surprised. Then why do you keep staring? Oh, sorry. I kind of have a migraine and you're so bright it's hard for me to look anywhere else. I said and drew my fingers through my hair, a little embarrassed. He snorted. He has the tiniest of laughs. I don't think anyone else has ever said that to me before. You are welcome. Are you sure you're okay? I asked again. Yeah, you go take care of your headache. My turn to snort. Whoever said headache about a migraine had never had one. I went back to my apartment, one hand on the wall because I still got black spots in my vision. When I opened my own door, I heard another one close behind me. The pain got a little easier. Still, all I could manage was going to bed and putting a pillow over my head. It had been the same thing for a week straight now. I got an hour of sweet silence when I came home from work, and then I heard the scream approaching. My head splitting slowly in two as he came closer. 
It was ruining my life. I couldn't take it anymore. I put on my sunglasses and went out to the hallway, banged on his door. Not knocked, I pounded my fist at his door. From inside I heard movements, swearing, but I also felt a slight relief. He opened the door, this time dressed in black so it was easier to look at him, noticing that he actually had a face with eyes, nose and mouth and a birthmark on his left cheek. Another migraine, he asked. What's up? You are the one standing at my door, he said and leaned on the doorframe, looking at me with a half smile even though his inside was in turmoil. I can feel you moping from the other side of the wall, so what is up? He shook his head, not understanding at all what I was doing. I forced my way past him. He was so surprised he didn't have the chance to react, to stop me. You've got any chocolate? I asked, going straight for the kitchen. The apartment was like mine but mirrored, so it was easy to navigate. Though he hadn't unpacked, so it didn't feel like a home yet. I could see some paintings leaned against one wall. So maybe he was just planning where to put things before decorating the place. I've got company, he protested and followed me. No, you don't. I didn't have patience for his nonsense. My head was exploding. And the only thing that was going to help was chocolate and coffee. So I was beginning with locating his stash of candy before forcing him to make me coffee. They are on their way, he tried, with slight desperation in his voice. No, they're not. I opened a cabinet. Empty. Opened the next one. Plates. Next one, and next one, until I finally found the one containing sweets. I easily found some chocolate and took it without asking. And I need coffee, I said. I don't have any coffee. I pointed at the coffee maker in the corner. He sighed and scratched his temple. I gave him a smile and jumped up on the counter. I'm trying to get rid of you, but since you can't take a hint, please leave, he said and made a gesture towards the door. Oh, I knew that already, I'm just ignoring it, because you are ruining the feng shui in the building, and I might kill you if my headaches don't stop soon. Now make coffee, I said, while opening the chocolate, putting a piece in my mouth. It melted on my tongue and I took a deep breath. Chocolate was heaven. He crossed his arms over his chest, I don't even know your name. Why should I make you coffee? Why should I not call the police and have them carry you out of here? I lifted my sunglasses and looked straight at him. Hi Milo, I'm Celine. If you call the cops to take care of tiny little me, they will laugh at you. And I'm friends with half of the people in this building, so you would make a lot of enemies. I said. And when he made a motion to interrupt me, I held up a hand to stop him. I read your name on the letter in the hallway. Now make me coffee. He surrendered, threw his hands up and went over to the fridge where he kept his coffee. I put another piece of chocolate in my mouth. Why are you here? And don't say feng shui, because I would throw you out of the window, not caring that we're on the seventh floor he said while measuring the coffee powder. I looked at him, really looked at him. The muscles on his arms were not from the gym, but rather looked natural from working with his body. He moved smoothly, like water flowing, quickly and without ever stopping, but still sort of elegant. The jeans he was wearing were worn and splattered with paint. I wondered if he was the one who had made the painting standing in the other room. I'm out of coffee and it felt like you needed company, I said. And it wasn't a lie. I really was out of coffee, but it wasn't the reason I was here. He nodded, accepting my explanation. Turned around and looked at me since all I was left to do was wait for the coffee. I had changed when I got home. The clothes I had been wearing at the office was in a pile on the floor. Instead I was wearing a t-shirt with a print of R2-D2 and a pair of basketball shorts. He seemed to approve of my shirt with a slight smile. 
Did you make the paintings in the other room? I asked and pointed in the direction of the living room. He looked up, surprised, then looked down with a frown, scratched his neck, fiddled with his feet. Yes, he said hesitantly, but... I jumped off the counter before he could continue, left the chocolate where I had been sitting, went to sit on the floor and began looking through his paintings. The first one was small, filled with light and colours. It was a close-up showing part of a boy running with a balloon on the sunset at a beach. I could feel the joy coming out of the painting. The next one was just as small and just as happy. Next one was slightly bigger, but completely different. It was dark with shadows and it was just paint. Don't look at that, he said. I flipped to the next one. It was dark, almost black, with teeth glinting at the edges. I could make out a tongue in the middle. I flipped to the next one, a black skeletal hand reaching from one side and a full hand from the other. Death and light reaching for each other. I said, don't look at that, he said harshly and grabbed my arm. I let him pull me away. My throat closed up and I closed my eyes behind my sunglasses. His hand was shaking against me. Sorry, I said. He said nothing, just let me go and went back out to the kitchen. A few of the cupboard doors smashed against the frames. I heard him whisper curses. A part of me wanted to go and hug him but I couldn't move. How was he living with this pain, with this constant scream clawing at him, trying to get out? I pressed my hand to my forehead. It helped a little with my pain. Here's your coffee, he said, and I looked up to see him coming out of the kitchen. He was holding two mugs. One of them was slightly outstretched to me. When he saw me, he looked a little concerned. Are you okay? It's just my head. I'll feel better when I get the coffee, I said and stretched out my hands to, to him. He gave me the mug. Sit on the floor in front of the couch, he said and made a gesture toward the couch. I looked surprised at him. He didn't feel like the type to avenge someone who had offended him. He rolled his eyes at me. Just trust me. So I did as he said. Put the mug on the table and sat down, leaning against the couch. He went and pulled on the curtains, reducing the light in the room. My eyes relaxed a little. He didn't feel like they wanted to escape my skull quite as much anymore. I looked at the empty walls. A single plant was standing in the corner next to a bookshelf with books in no order whatsoever. Next to that was a TV bench with a TV and then there were two more piles of paintings leaned against the wall. Milo put his mug next to mine and sat down behind me on the couch. He put his hands on my neck and something released in me. The pain subsided slightly. He did small circles with his thumbs. My head felt lighter and my eyes filled with tears. Not just from the pain subsiding, but something relaxing within him too. My mom used to have migraines. This is what my dad used to do to help her feel better. It feels great, I said, and a tear spilled down my cheek. I didn't let him see it. He was finally relaxing. You close with them? I was. They died in a car accident six months ago. My brother was in the car with them. So now it's just me. He was lonely. That's why he was in so much pain. He was all alone. Is that why you moved here? I asked. Yeah. I had to sell their house and most of their things because I couldn't afford to keep it. And I had just gotten this job, so I moved here. His voice was trembling slightly, but his hands were steady on my neck, working their way up to my head. I reached my hand back there and put a hand on his, squeezed it. You're not alone anymore. I'll be here, I said. You don't even know me, he said, and tried to force a laugh. Isn't that how it always is? You don't know each other and then you do, I guess. We were quiet for a while. 
He continued giving me a massage. It had been so long since I let anyone touch me, and it had been almost as long since he touched someone. Both of us relaxed. I'm scared, he whispered. It's okay, you're allowed to be scared, I whispered back. His hands fell off my neck. I turned around and saw him staring at the stacks of paintings. His face filled with pain. And clam I climbed up in the couch and hugged him. He didn't move, didn't say anything, but I just kept hugging him. We should drink the coffee before it gets cold, he said quietly. I let him go and he grabbed our mugs, put on the TV. I sat so close to him that our legs were touching and I didn't move. Just cradled my mug and sipped the coffee. Listened more than I looked at the TV. As I was swallowing the last coffee, I felt really tired. The pain was better but not gone. I put the empty mug on the table and lay it down, my head on his lap as a pillow. Reality drifted away. I didn't know how much time had passed when he spoke again. You know, the last thing they said to me was that they love me and are proud of me. So at least I got a good last conversation with them. Somehow it feels wrong to be happy about that conversation. You're allowed to be happy. They will want you to be happy, I said and hugged his leg. I couldn't open my eyes. I was so tired. Yeah, they would, he whispered. And the last of that screaming, clawing pain disappeared. Leaving behind a dull sadness. He relaxed into the pillows. Thank you.